Well, Mel, um, Mel asked me if I would moderate this uh, this panel today, and uh, I've been waiting to do this for years. <laughs> and what I'm trying to do is to uh, get the audience to support me. So maybe I'll get to do this again sometime. <laughs> Jack, uh, Jack Vogel on my left ruined my surprise. Um, we, I've been introducing the new panel, and uh, Jack is a surprise uh, panelist. And, uh, <laughs> but he, he ruined my surprise. Uh, as we know, Queen, Queen Laura wasn't able to be here, and uh, Jack volunteered to. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> okay, we. Co-opted Jack into a surprise guest. So let me uh, let me introduce the panelists. We've got Gus Sauter, uh, and we we know him from this morning. So please welcome Gus again. Next we have Bill Bernstein. He's the founder of Efficient Frontier Advisors and author of several successful titles. <clears throat> and Mel Lendauer, our next panelist, is one of the founders of the Bucklehead community. Uh, he's an author at Forbes.com columnist, so please welcome the Prince of the Bucklehead. <laughs> So we've got a number of questions that came from both participants here and uh, from uh, the website itself. So I think um, I'll start with a question from Dr. Bernstein from uh, Finance Club. And uh, the question is, how should we apply principle in your book, The Ages of Investor, to funding a 529 plan for college expenses? On one hand, it's investing a stream of contributions, which argues for a more aggressive allocation. On the other hand, it seemed a good candidate for liability matching with fixed income investments. And I think that a 529 is pretty clearly a liability matching portfolio uh, situation. It's got a time horizon that's at most, you know, 15, 16, 17 years. And its median uh, uh, age is going to be, or its median duration is going to be around, you know, seven or eight years. Uh, that's that's not stock territory. That's bond territory. So, you know, most 529 providers, or at least many of them, uh, offer a glide path that reflects that. It starts at maybe, you know, 70 or 80 percent stock very rapidly, goes down from there to almost. Uh, uh, no stock in five years, and I think that's that's appropriate. You're certainly not in a deep risk uh, sort of situation, and you're in a shallow risk situation. And this is a question for the panel from Dan. Uh, please compare the following two investment portfolios. The total stock market index admiral shares combined with the total international index admiral shares compared to a portfolio of Total index equity fund, total bond, and a money market or other cash fund. Anyone? Total international index. The question, see if I can be clear on this, is the question is whether you want your diversification out of the US stock in the international stocks on the one hand or the bonds on the other. Is that the nature of it? I think that's the nature of the question. Well, then why did you write it that way? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I did a read of the book. <laughs> and it was trying to compare the the total the total U.S. and the international as compared to the total index equity fund, total bond, and the money market. So I think the, I think that's uh, probably total global. So the, the concept of investing in your own Closer. Closer. Uh, so I, I think uh, the concept is, would you invest in total global, 
which has domestic and international in it, or would you invest in the pieces separately? Would you invest, would you invest in total stock market plus total international? And personally, I believe the latter. Um, total global has an asset allocation of uh, roughly 55% international, 45% US. And I believe that every um, investor should have a home country bias. Uh, and, and that's why I think you should invest in the two pieces. I, I personally think 30% is about the right level of international investment. The reason I say that you should have a home country bias is because uh, basically you say you invest uh, in order to, at some point in time, consume. And most of your consumption is going to be at home, so most of your investment should be tied to home. And I'll give you an example in Australia, over the first 10 years of, of this century, uh, the Australian stock market is much better than the world stock market. It was up about 7% a year, the world market was about flat. Uh, at the same time, the Australian economy did better because it was a very resource-based economy and China was demanding all the resources. So uh, what we saw was the, the economy moved forward quite dramatically. Prices escalated dramatically in Australia. Uh, Sydney is the third most expensive city in the world. Melbourne is the fourth most expensive city in the world. Uh, if you had invested in a global equity portfolio as an Australian, you would have had about 3% of your money invested in Australia. So your global equity portfolio would have provided about a 0% return instead of a 7% return you would have gotten in an Australian portfolio. Uh, now, I think an Australian should have some international investment, but, uh, but to only have 3% of invested domestically would be way out back in England. I, I personally feel comfortable more with a 30% uh, international allocation than a 55% allocation. I, I would agree with that. Completely. And I have a question for you, Gus, though, which is that the total world fund, the portfolio, is a good deal more expensive, at least in Vanguard terms, uh, than, than the components are. Uh, and, and why exactly is that? If, um, if you look at the way the economics work at Vanguard, uh, each fund has to pay a certain amount to keep Vanguard running. You know, each fund has a certain percentage of ownership of Vanguard, and then it has its own uh, variable costs as well. Those variable costs um, are, are somewhat, um, there, there are some economies of scale as the fund gets larger, uh, and the fixed costs that the fund bears uh, uh, become somewhat uh, cheaper as, as on a per asset basis as the fund gets larger. So it's really a question of the size of the fund. And what you see is as funds get larger, the expense ratios go down. As Vanguard has gotten larger, the overall expense ratio has gone down. So it's really reflecting the cost of running the fund, the smaller fund is more expensive. Anybody else? Okay. This is for Jack from uh, Stephen Ander. Uh, I'm a retiree. I live partly off my portfolio. Currently my bond allocation is entirely to Vanguard's total bond market index. In light of future interest rate increases, should I change this allocation? Perhaps I should diversify into a short-term bond fund question, or should I just leave it alone? Okay, uh, I'll answer that in just one second, because I do want to just take advantage of just this moment. Uh, after the session is over, I won't see any of you again until next year, God willing. Uh, and I just want to thank you all for being such wonderful people. I enjoyed the book signings. I enjoyed the photography. I enjoyed the selfies. <laughs> And uh, I talked for so long yesterday that why anybody would want me on this panel today, uh, I have absolutely no idea. And uh, But I'm here because I was asked to, I didn't sort of volunteer. So just thank you all for everything, is the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is I've done all these book signings, and now I would like someone to do one for me. So I'm going to pass that down to Bill Bernstein. I have three copies of that book in my office, and not ever sign. So please write a nice message to me, will you? No, 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 no pressure at all. You know what copy of what you want them to say, Jack? People ask me, but I know. And then I have also signed two books for the inestimable Gus Sawyer, because he wasn't here to get two latest bowl of diatribes, <laughs> one of which includes my version of the history of the index fund. <laughs> Every fact we have is the same. Every name we have, I name all those veterans. Mac McClone, who I knew myself, uh, 
Jack Train and a whole bunch of them. And uh, Paul Samuelson, who was not on his list, who was the key to starting the first index fund. And I explained why that difference is there between the quantitative school, so called all these computer worrying guys, uh, who got nowhere finally and had to change their what their Samsonite fund into an S P fund after we had started ours. So I'm not saying they borrowed it, how, how would anybody borrow anything like that? But they, they actually got religion after we, after we did, so we could divide them into the pre-religion and post-religion stage. <laughs> uh, and that's all described in so enjoy them, Gus. <laughs> I, I, I marked the relevant pages. <laughs> Here and then where 
uh, your utility curve is tangent to the efficient frontier and that determines your asset allocation. Well, the interesting thing is uh, the efficient frontier is going to shift if, uh, if you have lower expected returns for bonds, as we, we do now, uh, and that would mean that the utility curve is going to intersect at a, or be tangent at a different uh, place on the efficient frontier. And, and that would apply a different asset allocation. But if you expect lower bond returns, shouldn't you expect lower equity returns? Stocks and bonds compete for capital. And if we're in an environment where bonds are uh, providing very low returns, then shouldn't stock prices be bid up to the point where future expected returns are uh, correspondingly low for equities? And if you, if you believe that's the case, so instead of getting 10% a year from equities, let's say we're going to get 8% a year from equities, or maybe even 7%, uh, then you have to redraw your efficient funds here and uh, find out where it uh, is tangent to your utility curve, and maybe not coincidentally, it's the same asset allocation. So I think you have to uh, also think that that each, each one of these asset classes provides something in your portfolio. I mean, equities are going to give you, hopefully, the biggest return, and <coughs> bonds are there to moderate the volatility and still provide you with some rate of return. I think that role is still the same uh, in this environment. We just have to realize that uh, our expected returns are probably lower at this point in time. Okay, here's a question for the panel from uh, Tracy Denton. Uh, how often should a portfolio be rebalanced? One or two times a year? Should the state of the current market have any impact on the frequency or timing? Well, I, I favor bands as opposed to uh, timing. I think that... Is this working? Yeah. Yeah. I favor expansion bands as opposed to uh, uh, a specific uh, a time. Uh, I know everybody's got their own method. They do it on the birthday, they do it on the first of the year, they do it around Christmas time. But personally, I prefer, I know Jack's, uh, I think Jack doesn't favor rebalancing at all. Is that correct? Well, it's, it's, it's probably a reasonable reading of what I said. Let me, let me say what I think the facts are. Number one, Rebalancing costs you a lot of money over the long term because you're selling your higher yielding asset in favor of a lower yielding asset. You're getting produce, producing your stocks, which have an upward curve that's steeper than the return on bonds. So you should be going, going to any kind of rebalancing, realizing that. Now, that's the economic or financial impact of it. Uh, if you want to make sure that you're reasonably conservative, if you scare a little bit easily, as I do, and you want a decent size bond position, and uh, you, you probably do want to rebalance, I would say never, never, never use a decimal point in your calculation. I mean, it just, you know, maybe if, if, you, if you want to be 60, 40, and you get to over 65, 35, uh, you, you might think about rebalancing, or even 70, because it, it's really, uh, it, it's much more important what's in the portfolio, what you're paying for it, this is for investors generally. Uh, and all those factors are every bit as important as rebalancing. So I think we tend to overdo rebalancing. We did a bunch of, Michael and I did a bunch of, and maybe Kevin and I, a bunch of 25-year studies showing that rebalancing pays off, I think, about half the time, just about what you would expect. <laughs> you know, holding and holding and return constant at 60% or something. So I think it's a little bit overdone, and I, maybe even a lot overdone, and has given some idea of magic it doesn't exist anywhere in the field of investing. There is no magic here. Sometimes things go for you, sometimes times go against you. And uh, so I think you do want to be a little cautious. I mean, if you have a 50 50 target and you get to 80 20, you should have, you should have cut back something, maybe when you got to 60 or 70. But uh, it's, it's not any guarantee of better performance or anything else. It's a guarantee, I think, that what I like about it keeping a solid bond position is it, it keeps you from the behavioral issues involved in the kind of markets that we've had in the last few weeks. And tell me, the last few weeks have been so funny because every day, every odd number of day, you wake up and thinking, 
gee, I wish I'd had more in stocks. And every even number of days, I wake up and say, I wish I had more in bonds. And that's not going to get you anywhere. Just leave it alone to the extent you can. Well, uh, my understanding is the target date uh, funds uh, at Vanguard rebalance on a daily basis. Can you confirm that or straighten us out on that? Because yeah, well, what we do is take uh, the cash flow in, uh, into the funds and rebalance, retarget it towards the allocation that it's supposed to be in at any given point in time. So, you know, they're, they're really risk-based. And uh, at a certain age, we want you to have a certain level of risk, which implies a certain asset allocation. And if it does wander away, if we have cash in the portfolio that day, we're going to put it wherever we happen to be light. So it, it's seldom that we would actually sell out of um, a, uh, a position and rebalance it one another, uh, except in extreme market movements. So if, if uh, you know, 2008, 2009, we actually were rebalancing. <laughs> and actually something like balanced index rebalances every day. <coughs> Not necessarily that it's a great strategy, but you have cash flows coming in every day. And you're offering a fund that is a 60-40, 60 stock, 40 bond portfolio index. And you don't want to get to 61, because that may be too much for the person that's coming in that day. It's a, it's a kind of a, a consistency with objective strategy, rather than a personal uh, investment decision. But no, okay. I was just going to say, we, we do use bands so that we're not overdoing. Bill, you were going to make a comment, I thought. No, I was just kind of like a wisecrack. One of, one, of, one of the ways you can tell, in response to what Jack says, one of the ways you can tell that financial economists have a sense of humor is they do use decimal points. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, the next question is for the panel. Uh, it says, look into your crystal ball. The massive baby boom generation moves into retirement. What are the macro effects on the markets, pressures on portfolios, etc.? Well, I'll take a nice extreme position. Nothing. None. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason for that is uh, none of us can guess exactly how this will work. But stocks have a certain intrinsic value. And if a whole lot of people are buying stocks at, let's say, an arbitrary actual value of 100, uh, a whole lot of people are selling them. And so someone will be selling stocks as they go into retirement, presumably, but there will be other people buying them. And I don't know how you measure which demand is larger or which is smaller, but it should not, theoretically, in, in the long run, what drives stock prices and values is the dividend yield plus the subsequent earning growth. And so if you adhere to that, and it's, it is absolutely the case over 100 years, and an awful lot of shorter periods within that, that determines the market return. And it doesn't care whether old people own it, even people my age, or young people own it. So I'd say essentially nothing. Did I make myself clear? <laughs> I like to look at things in the broadest possible historical perspective. 5,000 years ago, nobody retired. All right, you worked until you died. But if you wanted to invest for retirement, it would take you about 15 minutes because returns were very, very high, and you didn't live for very long after you retired. Now, the first retirement contracts, if you will, were something called corrodies, which were uh, a Dutch instrument, and you would pay what amounted to about a year's worth of your salary for very basic food and shelter for the rest of your life. That's pretty darn uh, cheap. And I view retirement as a supply-driven commodity like anything else. So if you want to visit uh, you know, Venice or New York or San Francisco, so does everybody else in the world. The demand for that is very high. Uh, and uh, and uh, that's why those places are so very expensive. Well, retirement is getting to be the Venice and New York and London of the modern world. Everybody wants to retire now at age 55. Consequently, doing that is going to be very expensive. We've already commented on the fact that portfolio returns going forward are going to be very low. People are living longer and longer. Um, and if you think about it, you know, someone works from uh, uh, 25 to 55 and then dies into 85, and if the demographic curve is flat, that means that for every retired uh, person, there's one working person. That doesn't work very well. 
So I, I take a somewhat more pessimistic point of view than I guess Jack does. I guess I look at it uh, more globally. That uh, uh, It's hard to imagine that we would have a certain expected return for equities in, in the U.S. and a very different expected return in you know, Korea or uh, some developing nation. Uh, especially the way the world is becoming much more global in nature. So uh, capital is increasingly uh, able to move around the world and, and so I think that the expected returns will somewhat equalize given the fact that the risks are, are somewhat similar. So um, I guess I'm a little bit more Jack's kid. <laughs> This is uh, for Jack from T. Wilcox. Uh, which bond fund would you use for a three fund portfolio? Which which bond fund would you use for a three fund portfolio? Well, I made my position clear about the fact that I'm disturbed by the composition of the bond index itself, uh, and uh, I think it's just too heavy in governments considering that we talked about this yesterday with those charts. Too heavy in governments uh, too heavy in foreign ownerships, too heavy in federal ownerships, to represent a bond portfolio of a typical American investor, which would be investor holdings, insurance companies holdings, uh, pension fund holdings, and things of that nature. And I, I think a, a reasonable bond position would be in a highly arbitrary, but not 70%, but maybe 30 or 35%. And that's probably, if you look at all the bond funds out there together, as I mentioned yesterday, that's probably about where the competition is as well as where the U.S. market is. So I think we should have a much better bond index. And nobody at Vanguard, I, know, I think Gus felt, felt that agreed with me when I brought this up three years ago. And uh, I stopped bringing it up. <laughs> you, know, you don't want to beat your head against the wall. I've got too many issues to worry about other than that one. But uh, what I suggest in, in, instead of that is why not have half your money say as a working hypothesis, half it in the total bond market portfolio and half it in the corporate bond uh, intermediate term portfolio. The corporate bond intermediate term portfolio is the intermediate, but so is the total bond market intermediate. In other words, the long and short pretty much balance themselves out and they both have about the same duration. So you can do that without any change in risk exposure other than credit and improve your return by probably a half to three quarters of a percentage point a year. And in these days, stingy markets where we should have a much bigger edge we Vanguard than we do because the competition has more corporates and therefore higher yields and they come out to just about matching our bond market fund with lower costs and lower yields. So I, I think we're a little out of the mainstream if not a lot out of the mainstream and my choice would be the intermediate term corporate. I also tried and I think Gus did agree with me on this uh, to have them form an intermediate a corporate bond index fund. Corporate bond index fund would have a correlation with the intermediate term bond index of about 99. So why don't we just use either? I think corporate bond index fund is easy to explain. That's a big part of our job on the phones and our literature. And an intermediate term bond index begins with the fact that first our poor rep on the phone has to deal with why would, why would you choose the intermediate term index? It's a whole conversation that has nothing to do, in my opinion, with sound investment. Uh, practices. So give the simple route. It's always been my position. Make it easy to explain. Make the structure simple. And uh, so that's my choice to answer the question in more words that I should have as usual. <laughs> this next one is a question from Mel. Uh, could I ask, Gus, what, what do you think about the corporate fund, the total bond market index fund? Representative, unrepresentative? Well, by definition, it is representative. I mean, uh, is the market itself. Um, do I believe that it should be so heavily weighted in treasuries? Um, you know, with corporates, if you look at, at corporates, the extra return or the excess return from, from corporates is somewhat correlated with equities. So you're getting a little bit of a, an equity-like kicker in, in corporates that you can already get anyways in your equity uh, exposure. So I guess I, I still do think the total bond market is an appropriate investment vehicle. Um, 
I, I, I did agree with Jack uh, several years ago when he was talking about uh, doing a total corporate index fund for people who do want to avoid corporates. But uh, I, I still think the total bond market uh, is a rational investment. Okay, this is a question from Mel. Uh, given today's situation, what are your thoughts on the current high bond offerings? Well, when we compare them to the good old days when you could get the 3 4, 3 3, 3 6 uh, fixed rate, uh, and you could buy $30,000 worth of personal security in paper and 30000 in uh, electronic bonds. Uh, we say that uh, things are pretty sad. On the other hand, when we look at uh, the fact that they are tax deferred for up to 30 years, uh, they're risk free, they're adjusted for inflation, and you compare them to any other risk free investment that's available today, uh, despite the, uh, the good old days being gone, I think they're still a, uh, a good investment. Uh, compared to other options that are available. Uh, it would be nice if we returned to the good old days, but we have to face the facts that we have to compare them to what's available in CDs and uh, money markets and things like that. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Uh, so that I think that there's still a good investment for people who are comfortable uh, buying them strictly online. And the next one is a question for the panel from uh, Greg Bryson. Uh, recently, Paul Merriman spoke on what's wrong with Vanguard. He believes Vanguard should tilt more towards small cap and small cap value within Vanguard's total stock market fund. I would like to get the panel's feeling on this statement, both pros and cons. This is similar to what DFA funds do. I've got a really strong opinion on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the total stock market is the total stock market. Uh, you know, I put that argument up there, the zero-sum game and the negative-sum game, that applies to the total stock market. It doesn't apply to overweighting certain segments of the market. If you want to overweight those segments in your own portfolio, Vanguard does provide a small-cap value fund, a small-cap blend, a small-cap growth. So uh, for people who do want to take that bet, they can do it, but it wouldn't make any sense whatsoever to put it inside of the total stock market. Whether, you know, and it begs the question, uh, is that bet worth taking? You know, I, I alluded to it earlier that I'm not terribly wild about that bet because it's based on empirical work and the, the theory was developed afterwards. And, and people said, well, you know, I think you're getting extra return because you take extra risk. And I, I would ask the question, what risk are you compensated for? In other words, think of the original capital asset pricing model. We talked about systematic risk and non-systematic risk. And you were compensated for taking systematic risk, which is market risk. And you were not compensated for taking non-systematic risk. Non-systematic risk was risk associated with each individual stock. That could be diversified away, so why should society pay you to take that risk? If you look at uh, these the different segments of the market, and just think of the nine morning star style boxes, um, it, it, each one of those is more volatile than the market itself because they're, they're narrow, more narrowly defined. Uh, in, in a couple of cases, just marginally more volatile. But if they're more volatile, they're, they're, so they're riskier, should they have a higher return than the market? Well, if they did, then why would you own the market? You just own the pieces of the market. You put it back together that way. Well, that doesn't make any sense because you know they, they come back together again and they're the market. So uh, I think that uh, this arguably from a financial theory standpoint would be that it's, it's risk that's not compensated. It can be diversified away. Um, you know, there are a lot of people arguing behavioral finance aspects, but for me, uh, I'm just not too wild about taking factor bets. You know, let me just add to that. I, of course, agree with Gus, at least in this case. And, uh, <laughs> the, uh, I talked to you yesterday about the FA, and I simply don't believe you know, I know what the past data is, and I know the growth has done in the past, and you know, people use the expression, I'm sorry, value. But value does better than growth. I never want to hear that said. Value has done better than growth in the long term past, not does, but has done. And that's pretty relevant to me in the future. 
and small cap the same thing has done better in the past than large cap. In these long periods of going back to I guess 1928 or 26, something like that, uh, it's very clear that you can find 20, 25 year periods where the reverse is true. So we've got this period dependent comparison. It started at a certain point and it ends at a certain point. It's all I can do with any comparison you ever see is period dependent. We've also done a fair amount of work on how the real world works rather than those calculations out of Chicago work. And it turns out these things don't work nearly as well if you compare, say, at growth funds, growth mutual funds, with value mutual funds. And we've done a lot of work on that. And the, the results are not totally different, but quite different. And would lead you to no conclusion like that at all. So, and also if you believe that the stock market is a great arbitrageur between the present and the future, if it is categorically true that value in small cap are better, why then that the prices of value in small cap will be bid up at the expense of, of uh, large cap and, uh, and growth stocks, which will be bid down. So I don't see any reason it should hold in the future. And I also call on the chart I gave you, I'll reiterate the chart I gave you yesterday. When you look at all the morning star ratings, taken class by class by class, um, fair comparison, I mean, our value funds will be compared to DFA's value funds, value oriented funds, things of that nature. We are the highest ranking investment company complex in the, in the entire Morningstar ratings. We have a 50%, 58% positive rating. We only have 6% Vanguard funds or in one and two stars, and 65% are in four and five stars for a net of 58 is the way I do it. And uh, DFA is 16%, one and two, and 48%, their differential is 33%. And they still rank number six. This is good, and I salute them for that. But probably the main difference between one and six is they're charging 45 or 50 basis points a year, and we're charging on average 15. And uh, so if they want to get up and really get in the competition, reduce your cost, DFA. <laughs> now. Um, let me make the contrary case. Um, first of all, uh, I think that a more subtle definition risk is called for. Risk is more than simple volatility. And the best definition of risk that I know of is anti omanis risk, uh, which is you can basically summarized as bad returns in bad times. So if you look, for example, at the return of the small value corner during the most recent financial crisis, you were left with you know, uh, a return of minus 65% top to bottom versus about minus 55% for the total stock market, that may not seem like very much, but there's a big difference between being left with 35 cents and being left with 45 cents. So I think that, 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 that small, there's a good theoretical reason why small value stocks have a higher return. Um, it's not just that it's period dependent in the United States, the, at least the value premium is present in just about every single country you, you want it to. 15 out of 16 developed nations, I think with the Farm and French's uh, uh, international study, and I think 12 out of 16 emerging markets uh, nations. Now, having said that, the return of any factor, I believe, is roughly inversely proportional to the number of people chasing it. Uh, and in the current environment, everybody and their dog is chasing the small the value factors. You know? From DFA to Rob Armand and his crew to you know just about everybody else is pushing their version of smart beta. So I think that it's a much tougher road to hoe from this point forward if you're going to believe in factor-based investing. Bill, with all due respect, neither Benjamin Franklin Bogle or Sugar Bogle are two dogs are chasing small value stocks. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not those two blogs, yes. <laughs> uh, the next question is for Dr. Bernstein from Ray James. <clears throat> is, global <clears throat> is globalization depriving the benefit of diversification across regions? If so, can this be quantified or predicted reasonably? Well, Yes, if you, simple, if you look at simple short-term correlation of short-term periods, daily returns, monthly returns, we all know that the markets have become more correlated. The reason for that is simple. Vanguard and DFA and the ETF providers 
have made it very easy to get exposure to these corners of the world, to obscure corners of the world with the push of a key. Uh, and when that happens, correlations will naturally rise. Having said that, the long-term uh, uh, correlation value is still there. And all you have to do is look at the returns of various asset classes between, say, the 10-year period between 1999 and 2008, which comes too awful. Uh, bear markets, and what you see is that the broad U.S. market uh, had a nominal return of something like minus 20 percent over that 10-year period, whereas most other foreign asset classes, and particularly emerging markets, uh, had uh, in some cases triple-digit returns. So there's diversification that you can use. Now, I'm not you know, next time around, it, the pattern may be the reverse. All right. But we, uh, you know, I'm a strong believer in the fact that we cannot predict the future, therefore, we diversify. I'm a little slow, uh, uh, I'm still thinking about uh, Bill's last response uh, uh, about uh, uh, factor returns. And my point was not that there isn't actual more risk in small cap value or in small in general. It's just whether or not you should be compensated for that risk. In other words, there's, there's more risk investing in a single stock than any other um, where you can, you can invest. But are you compensated extra because you're investing in a single stock? If it's diversifiable, then you don't get compensated for diversifiable risk. And you know, should society pay people to take a bet on small cap value, the more risky segment of the market, uh, when society itself, in aggregate, doesn't bear that risk? Again, I think it depends upon how you define risk. Um, I define risk as what I feel in my stomach on March 6, 2009. Uh, and I think based on that measure, I think that small stocks deserve a higher return than those of other areas. Yes. Okay, the next is a three-part question for the panel from Bob Minardi. I'd be interested to hear the panel's viewpoints on portfolio construction in retirement based on three different approaches advocated by members of the panel. Age in bonds or some variant, the bucket approach based on when the money is needed, or liability matching portfolio, why keep playing when you've already won? <laughs> Well, I have, I have a question for Bill to, uh, along those lines. Uh, Bill, in your early book, you uh, showed that uh, an old bond portfolio was actually riskier than a portfolio with, I think it was between 7 and 12 percent in equities. So if you won the game, basically, uh, if you don't uh, invest in equities in theory. You it all in safe uh, investments, and yet that seems to contradict your findings in your early book. Yeah, um, you know, I can't be entirely consistent all the time, I suppose. Um, as Gene Farmer likes to say, I can't be right about everything, um, at least at the same time. Um, well, more seriously, you know, it, it, it's, there's no one approach that is best for everyone. You have to you have to look at your own personal situation. I think that in general, the person who has saved up just 15 or 20 years of residual living expenses, and that is what they need to live on in addition to their social security and their pension, if they're lucky enough to have that, that's the person who really should have a liability matching portfolio, which if not 0% stocks, should be fairly low. It was a bad draw early on, let's say even a 30, 70 or 50, 50 portfolio they very well make that person run out of money. Uh, on the other hand, Warren Buffett's widow can invest 100% you know, of her money in the Vanguard Index Trust 500 because the dividend yield on that, even a quarter of the dividend yield on that, would presumably pay her living expenses. So if you can tolerate, you know, if you have you know, 50 or 100 times your residual living expenses in your, in your, in your portfolio, uh, and you can emotionally tolerate 100% uh, stocks, why not? Uh, and age equals bond is a, it's a good shorthand for, for approximating, I think, what the middle course is for most people. It's, it's a matter of personal taste more than anything else. <coughs> on the 
liability matching portfolio. It's a theoretically extremely sound idea. But today, with interest rates where they are, funding it is beyond the financial ability of just about every corporation that has a pension plan. They really can't do it. And we've had to put a whole lot more money in. And that would reduce executive compensation, it would reduce corporate earnings, all those things that are totally unacceptable. It would reduce the, would reduce the price of the stock in the, in the uh, the stock market for all those short-term speculators that are holding it, and uh, all that militates against just the sheer ability to have a liability matching portfolio. And they may want to try it anyway, and there are all kinds of financial machinations naturally going on out there where they sell the liabilities to an insurance company. I'm not sure exactly how all that works. People are trying to get around this without putting up any more money, but they keep a lot of that liability when they sell it all. And I don't know how any, any, if anybody really knows how to account for that. So it's very sensitive. Our corporations are very sensitive to these pension contributions. And so they try and work their way around them by assuming higher returns than they will ever get, even though those plans are underfunded by, I think the number is $5 trillion is the underfunding in private and public uh, pension plans in the US, most of which, I think it's $4 trillion, is the underfunding of, of uh, state and local government plans, public pension plans. So we have a real mess on our hands, and in GM, the first company or the first municipality goes belly up, Detroit gave us a good example, uh, is going to find they're dealing with a financial situation that is, you know, it's just un untenable. Uh, the system doesn't work, uh, except if they go out and raise taxes, and of course the taxpayers have to approve that, and they're not going to approve it. So there's only, only so many options you have left. So it's a complex idea, the idea of liability matching. It is theoretically, I mean, you could write a book on how perfect it is, but it just doesn't seem to work. Uh, the next one is a question for Bill Bernstein from Paul Logerson. For the past three plus years, you've advocated holding very short-term bonds, primarily the treasuries, taking the risk in equities. Do you still maintain this view? Well, Paul, you're wrong. I've been suggesting that for the past seven years, and I think well, there's six on it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that in finance, at best, you're going to be right uh, uh, 60 or 55 percent of the time, and this is this, this falls into the, the other the other category. Uh, that said, I'm still comfortable holding uh, uh, you know, relatively short-term bonds. But uh, do I have a little on my face? Yeah, a little bit. This is uh, for Mr. Bogle. Um, what do you recommend for individuals and organizations who need reliable, predictable income? A mixture of individual securities, dividend paying stock, preferred stock, and bonds, or do you still believe a portfolio of index funds is best? Well, I, it's, it seems to me quite clear that you're depending on income, it is a long way from irrational to depend on higher yielding common stocks as well as bonds. Of course, don't accept the market return. And the purists will say, I'm wrong here, which is fine. But you need the money. And you can probably get out of, I'm not sure the exact yield of Vanguard, uh, high dividend fund. Uh, I look at it in the paper just about every day. Uh, and uh, it has a return very comparable to the market. I don't know what the yield is, but I'm going to guess it's about 3%. And you're going to have a correlation with the market, probably 96 or 97 that fund, because the big companies in America, think of the S&P, the total stock market, are by and large dividend paying companies, not necessarily high dividend paying companies. So I think it's a good strategy if you need the income, and most people do. And I think the risks are very small, but I, and I also continue to differentiate. I think probably a lot of, a lot of my fellow panel, panel members talk about returns, and returns are very uncertain. But dividends are quite certain. There's only been, as I showed you in that chart yesterday, only been one significant dividend cut in the last, well, since 19, I think it's 1935. That's what is that, 80 years, and when the banks all cut their dividends back in 2008. And uh, so dividends are quite reliable. And I look at dividends as being real and market returns being to some degree illusory. And if you don't believe market returns are illusory, just check the percentage changes in the market in each of the last eight days. 
No, it's like this. I never said anything quite so crazy in my life. I had no trend. And so I, I like that strategy. I like a strategy for an investor that needs the income and understands the risk of a more of a corporate bond strategy than a total bond market strategy. And there are a lot of investors, many, perhaps many of you in the room, maybe most of you in this room, who are in this game for some income. And I think we ought to make sure we have options that are available. And we do have at Vanguard uh, through uh, our high dividend yield fund and our high, high dividend fund and our, uh, and our uh, intermediate term corporate bond fund. So look at all the options. And I think the, the, the incremental risk is small. So don't do it maybe with your whole portfolio, but do it with 75% and have the rest of the other 25% pick the number out of the air here. Uh, and just kind of down the middle, totally down the middle. This is almost down the middle. The next is a question for the panel from uh, Samuel Mahler. What do you think of Vanguard Managed Payout Fund for a retiree? How about a way, how about as a way of simplifying if one's spouse has no interest in investing? There's only one of them left, so you have to use the singular. <laughs> I guess, I guess I invented those, so I'll... Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the funds are designed to try to minimize volatility and yet provide a reasonable rate of return. And so we pursue that with a number of different asset classes, as more broadly diversified than, say, the uh, target date funds. Uh, even now, using uh, some alternative beta strategies we put into development about uh, almost a decade ago now. Uh, and, and those, those uh, alternative beta funds have worked out as expected. Uh, but um, I think that by and large, the managed payout funds are, are, are fund is meeting its objective. Uh, I, I think we did have too many funds. Uh, you know, uh, we had the seven percent fund, and, and everybody was putting their money in that uh, without the realization that probably you weren't going to get the, your, your standard of living is going to go down over time and everybody said, well, why don't I take the 5% fund when I can get a 7% fund? Um, but the, the, the end result is very different. Um, so I think it's, a, it's an appropriate investment. Uh, I wouldn't make it my entire investment to, for my retirement assets, but uh, again, the design is to be a balanced approach, a broadly diversified approach that still provides a uh, reasonable rate of return uh, and with much lower volatility. And the volatility has been less. Uh, volatility is every investor's enemy. I mean, the same return uh, in a volatile portfolio is one that's constant. Uh, I'll give you numbers. 10% uh, and 10% over two years gets you a 21% return. Zero and 20 gets you a 20% return. So you, you don't want volatility. So those portfolios were designed to try to address that volatility. <coughs> Well, Gus, was that uh, designed as an alternative to annuities, like a SPIA, a single premium immediate annuity? Um, yes, except for the fact that it does have more uh, more volatility. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it was it was designed to be, uh, you know, something you can have in retirement, really count on the amount of income, the income growing uh, over time with inflation. And, and hopefully even a little bit on a real basis. Uh, but, and, and do it in a very low cost fashion. The problem with the annuity is that you're, you know, it's, it's high cost. And so, well, not only that, but you lose the money. You lose the... Yeah, but most people don't buy annuities if they're sold annuities. No, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a single premium immediate annuity. Yeah, I'm not what I mean, they're, they're sold. I mean, nobody goes out looking for one. It's a salesperson comes to you and sells you one. Well, I think in this group, uh, uh, single premium immediate annuities are one uh, an acceptable uh, option for all the bids. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Because I think a lot of hesitation people have is that you know, it's the risk of uh, dying tomorrow when exactly. you gave up all your principal. Uh, so that's why they're still relatively small as an investment vehicle. But when the, uh, when the managed payout funds came out, I thought that this was a good alternative for people who could accept the variability in the, uh, in, in the returns to, because they still retain the assets as opposed to a single premium immediate annuity where they lost the assets. Yeah. 
if, if I can say something slightly scandalous, or perhaps moderately scandalous, a lot is written about the annuity, annuitization puzzle, which is why more people don't do it. And Nell's given you know, one good reason, and so is, so is, so is Mr. Sauter. But uh, you know, what we find when we look at annuitization is there are lots of good reasons not to do it. And it turns out that a lot of the people who write about the annuitization puzzle receive very large consulting fees from the insurance industry. No. <laughs> say it ain't so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, say it ain't so. <laughs> okay, here's a question for the panel from Victoria F. In March to April, we were bombarded with the news about high frequency training, high frequency trading, HFT. What is your current opinion about HFT and the merits of Vanguard using HFT resistant exchanges such as IEX? Again, I guess that kind of falls on me. Um, I've actually been somewhat vocal that uh, I think the, all the uproar about HFT is uh, uh, sells books and um, actually has had less impact. It's interesting, you know, I, at the end you have to have some metric to measure the quality of a market. So what, what would that metric be? It would be transaction costs. I mean, that's really what the fallout is when you're uh, investing. And if you look at transaction costs 15 years ago, they were well over 1% to buy the average equity. Today, it's about 35 basis points. So transaction costs have absolutely plummeted in the last 15 years. And there, there are several reasons why. There was a very significant change in what's called the order handling rules in the mid-1990s, 1996, I believe. And that led to the proliferation of different trading venues. Prior to that time, there were really uh, only four different places to trade, four or five. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you see this explosion of trading venues. And, and I would say that I'm not in favor of that. I don't like all of the uh, dark pools and, and uh, all the trading venues. But they're there, and you'd be crazy not to use them. Uh, but that led to the proliferation of exchanges. Then we had another uh, very significant change, the uh, decimalization uh, in the, uh, 2002, I think. That led to a collapse in spreads. Uh, we then had, with this proliferation of exchanges, we ended up um, uh, with kind of a mess. The exchanges weren't tied together, and so the SEC created what's called Reg NMS, National Market System. And, uh, that tried to bring all these uh, 52 different trading venues together again. Uh, and then, but they needed some vehicle to do that, and that's what high frequency traders do. Uh, you know, one, one function high frequency traders do, you'd be very familiar with. The, uh, they tie the exchange traded fund prices to the underlying securities, or futures prices to the underlying securities. So the, the prices would wander away if there weren't people arbitraging to keep them close. Um, so all of this has come together to create an ecosystem, and it's not an ideal ecosystem, but it has resulted in a dramatic decline in transaction costs. Uh, we live in a much better place today than we did 15 years ago. Could it be better? Yes, I think it could be better. I don't like uh, the current market structure. Um, interestingly, the, the, uh, the issues brought out in, in Flash, uh, Flash Boys really aren't the, the real problems. Uh, um, there are some problems with high frequency trading, but not the ones brought out in, in that book. Uh, so the SEC is reviewing uh, uh, order types, and that's really the biggest issue is, is order types. So most institutional traders, and certainly individual traders, don't know what these order types are that high frequency traders are using. If you use those same order types, you're totally immune to high frequency traders. Um, but so I, so I think there are some issues. I, I think they're way overblown in Flash Boys. We, we definitely live in a better world today. And I, I do worry that if all of a sudden somebody came in and said, get rid of all high frequency traders, we go back to the old world. And that was not a good place. Let me, let me, let me expand on that literary dimension, which is the essence of, of good nonfiction writing is compelling narratives. Uh, and the narratives that Mr. Uh, you know, Lewis had were spectacular, you know, people cutting straight lines through mountains across the Appalachians, heroic young uh, you know, financial analysts discovering irregularities in the system. Never mind the fact 
that you know the cost of this to the individual trader who's unaware of them might be a basis point or two versus the hundreds or thousands of basis points uh, you know that are garnered by um, audacious mutual fund brokerage industry. That's not a good narrative. And he pretty much admitted that. He said, yeah, everybody knows that Wall Street is corrupt and it's creaming trillions and billions of dollars off from individual investors, but that just wasn't a good enough story for me. This was a much more compelling narrative. <laughs> let, let me uh, just suggest to Gus that you read with great care my uh, editorial in JPM for summer called the Flash Boy and High Frequency Trading. By the time you get through it, Gus, you will think, why is he putting my name to your work? <laughs> <laughs> or your name to my work, I guess would be a better formulation. <coughs> totally agree with you. This is uh, what happens. What, once again? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's great. This is a question for the panel from a Frugal Investor. Given that a retiree has ensured a basic survival budget using Social Security and single premium immediate annuities, I've been reading with interest various discussions on boldheads.org about a variable withdrawal method. For those of you who may be familiar with it, what are your opinions about it? Is it any better or safer than other withdrawal methods? And if so, why? Well, sure. You know, a variable, flexible withdrawal method that reduces withdrawals when the returns are low or negative is obviously going to have a better survival percentage probability than one that has a fixed one that doesn't change uh, with, with portfolio returns. So the question is, how flexible are you? If you're very flexible, then by all means, use a variable method and you're going to increase your chance of, uh, of, uh, of, of retiring successfully. The only problem is that will come at a cost of reduced consumption. There's always this trade-off between safety and consumption that you've got to figure out on your own. Anyone else here care to comment? Well, I think the, the other threat of a lower, uh, of a reduced income stream is uh, also that you have to consider inflation in there. So when you consider that plus the lower uh, withdrawal, uh, it's kind of a double hit. Okay, here's a question for the panel from Disaprius. Uh, Dr. Bernstein, Bernstein sometimes cites Reckenthal's rule, if the bozos know about it, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, for all panel members, in your opinion, is this just one of those amusing platitudes that sometimes fits and sometimes doesn't, or is there actually actionable wisdom in it? <laughs> there is no universal truth. <laughs> I think it's a useful rule at extremes, uh, and you know, one of the I think the most if we're going to talk you know, financial foreign market timing here, one of the most reliable indicators, in my opinion, is when all of your neighbors are doing something, it's generally a good idea that you don't do it, and when people start arguing with you and getting angry at you because you disagree with them, that's an almost uh, certain sign that they're wrong. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, I would just say arbitrage is a very strong phenomenon. So if, uh, if everybody does uh, perceive something, they'll arbitrage it away. OK, here's a question for the panel from Ray James. Gold and tail risk. How much would each of you allocate to gold in a hypothetical portfolio purely for diversification? <coughs> Well, if the portfolio has a 25 or 50 year time horizon, say an endowment fund, I would allocate 5% to gold just in case something awful happens that will help you a little bit. Other than that, I don't think it should be used. Or, alternatively, instead of 5% gold, you can do 2% precious metals equity, which does effectively the same thing. Uh, and use another more, smaller portion of your portfolio. By the way, Precious metals equity prices have fallen in the past three years by 70%. Let me just reiterate for all of you a very simple fact about gold and precious metals and any other commodity. 
they have no internal rate of return. I said this yesterday. Stocks have dividend yields and earnings growth. Bonds have interest coupons. Precious metals, commodities, gold have nothing. So when you buy that particular security, you're basically betting you can sell it for more than you pay for it. And that is exactly the definition of speculation. So you, know, you want to be very careful. We all know it gets very popular when gold is at 3,000 or wherever it got, 3,300, I don't know. And it used to be the big thing in Forbes about 40 years ago. And then it didn't do well for a long time. So everybody forgot it. Remember it after it's done well. So just keep in mind that if everybody's talking gold, it's the time to get out. Now, now that everybody's talking non-gold, it's probably the time to get in. God knows. But except, it's a bet. And you shouldn't be betting in your portfolio. Except Ron Paul said, and I quote, it could go to infinity. <laughs> this is number four uh, that I agree with Jack on. Uh, I, I, I have a, a different perspective in that I was a gold miner. 1982 to 1985. Uh, it took me three years to bankrupt the company that I put together. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm cured now. Uh, I, I, I do believe that gold is not an investment. Uh, gold is, could be, as, as Jack said, uh, uh, a catastrophic hedge. If you, you know, to me, if the world blew up, you know, gold is, is your catastrophic hedge. But I don't, uh, I don't place a big, uh, high probability on that. So I wouldn't put a whole lot of money. Well, it's certainly not considered a Yeah, I think that uh, some people consider it an inflation hedge, but in my portfolio, I have uh, one $20 gold piece that I inherited from my dad, and I use uh, tips and I bonds for my inflation protection. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Uh, there are two types of inflation. So there's anticipated inflation and unanticipated inflation. And gold and other commodities are good uh, inflation hedges with unanticipated Inflation. In fact, one of the best, uh, one of the few good ones. But then, once inflation is anticipated, all of a sudden equities are probably your best hedge against uh, anticipated inflation. You know, as far as gold as an investment goes, this is exactly the point where Rick Ferry has to raise his left hand. There we go. There's the best gold investment you can make. Best gold investment you can make. <laughs> there, there is a, a very important point here that I don't think anybody with Cliff Asness uh, has talked about. And he's at this wonderful war, if you can get a hold of this, it's all public, with Paul Krugman, who says the Fed has stopped inflation. And uh, Cliff Asness says the, the Fed has stopped price inflation for the things we buy, but they have increased the inflation of financial assets. We've had huge inflation in financial assets due to the very Fed programs that are holding inflation down on things like the CPI. So it's not an open and shut case. And uh, you know, it's, a, it's almost like you push something in here because it's whack-a-mole or something, and it pops up over here. And uh, that's a very important point to realize. That the Fed, I think, is kidding itself in a lot of ways by giving themselves the hero's pat in the back. Always a worrisome thing, except when Gus and I are concerned. <laughs> <laughs> So you want to think about what's really happening and they require looking at financial assets as well as the normal consumer price, the usual basket, basket of consumer goods. Here's a question for the panel. Um, what fixed income choice and asset allocation do you advise in the current climate for individuals that have little or no tax advantage space and want an only large taxable account? I mean, you know, you should diversify. Uh, you should have a fair call of uh, very safe assets, uh, treasuries, CDs. Uh, you know, Alan Roth will tell you how to do great with, with CDs. I'm going to listen to what he's writing about that. Uh, and, you know, munis as well. But, you know, the mistake that a lot of people make is they put 100% of their fixed income into their single state, into, into munis in their own state, which is, can be a disastrous uh, uh, mistake uh, to make. Uh, credit, uh, you know, or alternatively, just buy the total bond market. Yeah, let me just say that you know, this is one of those questions where everybody wants the answer, and there is no answer. One example here, and I agree with what Bill says, 
It depends, first of all, by far the most important than what your time horizon is. If you're investing for the next five years, you probably should not be in the stock market. If you're investing for the next 10 years, you should do it moderately. If you're investing for, as everybody must know, if you're investing for another 75 years, which our young people are doing today, you should not only be 100% in the stock market, you should be levered. Uh, you should be wholly levered, and you will double your market returns, almost without any question. Then you got to be ready to stick, stay, stay through all the storms we get. But all these things depend on so many individual factors. Time horizon is a big one. Risk tolerance is a big one. The dimension of your financial goals. You know, if you, need, if you think you need to make more money, you can try and do it in one stock. Not necessarily always the best idea. But uh, it, it, it's a, we're all individuals. We all have our own behavioral problems. We all have our own hopes and fears. And so I, I, think, I think we're getting into a rules-making society as if we're all one, the same individual. And if anything is true, I, we have in this room probably 230 totally different individuals, even husbands and wives. <laughs> I, 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 I devoutly wish that when I was a young man, I could have tolerated a 100% or doubly levered portfolio, but I don't believe there are any sentient beings in this quadrant of the galaxy capable of doing that. Well, unless you consider, that. Unless you consider um, having a mortgage on your house. I mean, that's you could uh, not have a mortgage on your house, and you'd have less to, to invest. You think a mortgage on your house, you have more. And one of the obvious things is tax efficiency and uh, what tax brackets they're in. Uh, I have a friend who sold his business for uh, a very large sum, and so most of his accounts are in the tax, you know, most of his assets are taxable. So in his case, he uses munis to reduce the uh, tax burden, and he uses things like the stock market uh, for his equities because that's a very tax efficient uh, holding. Here's a question for the panel about what major trends you have seen in the last five to ten years that you think are here to stay or will grow. What new products, academic research, or legislation change will have the biggest effects on the both that investment strategy? First, never use the word product in my presence. <laughs> we aren't selling products, for God's sake. And actually, I banned the word when I was running Vanguard. You had to pay a $5 fine if you used it. <laughs> 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 the usage went to, to almost zero. I just think it's the wrong way to look at it. It's a great way to look at it. Beer, it's a great way to look at, I don't know, toothpaste. And it's a great way to look at bread. God knows what else. But we're not in the product selling business. I think we have created too many products in this business, far too many. Because most, quote, products, quote, are created to enrich the provider of the service and not the, the consumer of the service. Wall Street creates products to make money for... Anybody want to spend a little time guessing who they tr create these new products for? <coughs> to make money for themselves. I mean, this is not complicated. So, you can't... It is, I think, absolutely true that there is no way to improve on the oil market index fund. None. You can. The, the only way to beat the market is to have an individual strategy that can win or lose. But overall, as we've said a thousand times here, I think you've all gotten the message even before you came all the way here this, these last couple of days. Uh, it is the universal strategy, and it cannot be. It's mathematically correct. It is a tautology, and nobody can outdo that. So I hope we won't try. Because whenever you try, you know, I don't much like I gave actually at the height of the boom back in 2007, talking about financial innovation at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. I think this is in my book. Don't count on it, maybe. One of the two books, the latest book. And uh, I took a great view of innovation in America, in products, services, all those kind of things, technology and a very dim view of it, but it is. And the next thing I knew, the roof had fallen down, and it all collapsed, all those great innovations, all those great derivatives, all those mortgage-backed securities, and all those phony, what the heck were they called? Gus and Max had in their books, that they, they said that they would guarantee the, the principal. 
to work with the special, special, on the special investment. And uh, the banks were putting them out as money market good to the clients, but they weren't money market good because of their asset bank, and they had to eat a lot of that stuff. Poor old Chuck Prince of Citibank, who had to keep dancing as long as the music was playing. I'm sure he'd like to take that one back. <laughs> um, you know, suffered greatly from it. You know, thinking they had to keep in the flow of the market, keep trying to outdo it, products that people would buy, uh, and it's all just a charade. It's a phony business, the financial business, because we're all trading with one another, and as I mentioned in one of my books, we, Lloyd Blankfein, Goldman Sachs, and everybody else says, this is, financial business is a great business. Uh, we provide new capital to industry. Uh, we make it possible for innovation and all, blah, 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 blah. And it's true. And uh, the market produces about $250 billion, I think the number is, providing new capital, the classic function of finance, oiling financial system, oiling the Increasing the wheels of capitalism, all great. And compared to that 250 billion, we trade with one another to the tune of 36 trillion dollars a year. So investment accounts for what is that? Six tenths of one percent of what we do in the marketplace, and speculation accounts for 99.4 percent. Is this a great financial system or what? <laughs> Jeff, let me see if I understand what you were saying. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I knew I didn't make it clear enough. I have a little story about when Jack banned the word uh, uh, product. He also banned the word uh, sales. And uh, so Bill McNabb at the time was head of the institutional sales department. And so I, uh, from that day forward, I've been telling him he was head of uh, purchase facilitation. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, I like it better, but it won't fly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am concerned with the development uh, over the last 10 years, and it's, it, you might have picked it up on my presentation about uh, the, the so-called smart beta. I mean, the one line on there that you saw, uh, ETF.com being quoted as anything but market cap weighting. And, uh, you know, I agree with Jack that uh, market cap weighting is the one, it's the one investment that has that topology proving it is the, uh, the correct way to invest. Doesn't mean that other things might not outperform, but we'll know after the fact, we won't know before the fact. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, what's happened in the past 10 years, I mean, I, I don't think there's anything new in the world. Uh, the, only, the only thing that's new in the world is the history that we haven't, that we haven't read. Human, human nature's not going to change. There's going to be bubbles. Uh, there's going to be panics. Uh, companies will continue to crawl into your lap and fall asleep. I, I don't think that uh, there's anything new in the past 10 years in finance. I don't really take much cognizance of it as an individual investor. Again, this will be the last question for this panel, and this is for uh, Mr. Bogle from John Becker. Uh, I would like to have you ask Mr. Bogle if he is a stickler for periodic portfolio reallocation, or if he is just Still, just believe you should set it up one time and let the market move it all around at will. <laughs> I don't mean to equivocate, but it all depends. <laughs> 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 